So without further ado, I will hand you over to Graham Ayling, who is the uh, pro Senior Project Manager at the Energy Saving Trust and also for the EU Heroes Programme. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Graham. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'd just like to echo Michael's welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. <clears throat> the aim of this webinar is that it's part of the dissemination of our uh, EU Horizon 2020 funded project, EU Heroes. Um, that project is focused on uh, community solar and in particular, the challenges of integrating it into the network. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna give an introduction to that in a minute, uh, but just to, to start, just to kind of echo what Michael was saying. Um, I'll start with the usual caveat that at the minute, all of us are, are still working from home as part of our response to the pandemic. Uh, so bear with us. We may have internet outages, bandwidth issues, interventions by children, pets, noisy neighbors, who knows, um, but we'll do our best to deliver, deliver things smoothly. Um, I guess we're all becoming experts in webinars now, so uh, we know how it works. Um, the uh, the agenda is up there on the screen at the minute. Uh, so this morning's session, what we're going to do is um, I will talk through what um, we found from the project, some experience from this uh, EU partnership project. And then uh, my colleague Paul is going to talk a little bit about uh, an Excel based tool that we've developed through the project, which we're going to make available to people to help uh help with planning pv projects um and we've then got a bunch of case studies of uh projects that kind of highlight some of the opportunities around community pv uh, and there's some really interesting models in there amongst those those case studies uh, we've then got a lunch break and then we've at, we've got a separate webinar in the afternoon uh which you can register for separately and, and we'll we'll perhaps just put the link up in the in the chat um, later on just for anybody that hasn't seen that and if, if you're not registered and you want to join this afternoon. Uh, and then this afternoon is going to be a little bit more about um, the kind of support that's available for uh, community PV in the UK. So we're going to talk through some of the different schemes there. And then we've got a round table at the end with those speakers to talk about what we think the future of community PV is in the UK and, and the direction. And, and that should be really interesting. I mean, as you can see, we've got a really strong uh, bunch of, of expert speakers there who will have interesting things to say, no doubt. Um, so that's kind of the introduction. Um, I will now give you a rundown on what we've uh, been finding through, um, through the EU Heroes project. So I'm going to talk through uh, the basics of the project, where it came from, what we did and what we learned. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy recommendations because this was a project that wasn't originally about policy recommendations, but uh, the European Commission actually asked us to incorporate that into the project for reasons that will become clear as I run through the presentation. But just to start off, quick introduction to Energy Saving Trust. I'm sure a lot of you know us very well, um, but for anybody that doesn't, uh, we were established in 1992. Um, our focus is very much about addressing the climate emergency. That's our, our core mission. Uh, we're independent and impartial and we're a mission driven organization. So, you know, our, our surpluses get reinvested in that mission. Uh, we work across the UK, uh, but also internationally. So this project is part of our program of, of European projects, but we also work uh, much, much more widely than that. Um, we're best known for domestic energy efficiency, partly because of the name and partly because of you know, big programs that we've that we've run over the years. But we have actually always done a lot more than that and, and particularly uh, more recently. So community energy has always been kind of a big part of what we did way back um, to things like the uh, CAFE programme that some of you may remember in Green Communities and LEAF and, and even before all of that, the innovation programme was a funding scheme that actually that funded a bunch of very early um, community energy activity as well. But our our biggest projects at the minute around community energy are for Welsh and Scottish governments. Um, so we work with a consortium of others to deliver the CARES programme up in Scotland to support community renewables and community energy projects. Uh, and in Wales, the Welsh Government Energy Scheme. 
Uh, we're also increasingly working on transport, uh, a lot on EVs. We um, do work supporting EV charging networks, work on reducing carbon emissions from fleets. Uh, we, we've recently kind of really expanded our work around low and zero carbon technology for development. So working with on getting low energy appliances out to developing countries, but low energy appliances that are designed to work in off grid and microgrid situations uh, of the sort, you know, kind of the, the, the sort of thing that development charities do um, and, and uh, basically helping with access to energy and helping developing countries to kind of leapfrog the fossil fuel age, I guess, and, and, and uh, develop renewables. We do a lot on energy data insight and research um, to basically underpin the rest of the work that we do. Uh, and um, we support local authorities in particular, but also governments around energy strategy and, and climate emergency. A lot of work in Scotland on renewables. Uh, we also work a bit on water efficiency, quite a wide range of different different projects. So um, I just kind of thought a useful update for people to, to see where we're coming from. So the EU Heroes project, as I said, the aim of it is to try and enable increased growth of community PV through new models that kind of work with better grid integration of PV. Uh, and the activities that we're doing were, were to try to better understand the needs of both communities and network operators in this area, to then try and develop business models that respond to that and to pilot those business models funded by the Horizon 2020 project at the EU and, and the partnership involved seven different countries. So the lead was Netherlands, RVO in, in, in Netherlands, the National Energy Agency. And then we also worked with Germany, Spain, Greece, Lithuania and Poland. So kind of quite good mix there of countries that have high penetration of PV in the grid, some that have got well-developed community energy sectors, some less so, uh, which gave us a good kind of Kind of pan-European perspective. And the idea came partly from our experience of working on the Welsh Government uh, Community Energy Programme, uh, supporting Welsh communities, particularly in South Wales, where the, the network is very constrained. Um, so, you know, people having to deal with, um, with constrained connections, with high cost of connection, um, and then all of that in the context of uncertainty over regulation and, and subsidies. And, and we've found very much that there are similar challenges across Europe and all of that then kind of within the, the context of the urgency of net zero. But the other really important bit of context for all of this uh, is European level policy. So the European Renewable Energy Directive, around the time that we were setting up this project about three years ago, um, started to introduce Article 22 on renewable energy communities, but basically what, what this was doing is enshrining the right to develop community energy across the whole of Europe. Um, that's the, the, the kind of core aim. So uh, there's another article that sits alongside it, Article 21, which deals with prosumers. So basically the right to generate your own electricity um, in the home. Uh, so it covers self-consumption and communities. and it's enshrining the right to produce, consume, store and sell renewable energy without being subject to punitive taxes or regulations around that and to also importantly be paid a fair price for the electricity that you export. So this was very much targeted at dealing with some areas where there were kind of really uh, barriers that were really blocking access um, for, for community energy. So that was then really useful context because it meant that all member state governments are, are starting to look at how they can um, introduce introduce this. And I'll say a little bit more about this later on. Uh, obviously for us in the UK, um, there were some challenges around, around Brexit, um, created uncertainty for the project overall, but we've continued the project finishes at the end of August. So um, we'll be able to complete it as part of the partnership, which is good. But certainly from the perspective of Energy Saving Trust, we feel that it's really important to keep collaborating with other countries to tackle climate change. It's a global problem. We can't tackle it on our own. So we will continue to work um, with other organizations across Europe and elsewhere to do that. Um, but also <clears throat> this kind of European policy may have 
some implications for UK depending on the shape of our future relationship with Europe and uh, future trade deals. And just at the bottom there, that's the hyperlink to the uh, the relevant bit of the Renewable Energy Directive, um, which is worth having a look at. Um, we do have a potted summary as well, which we will uh, make available perhaps on the EU Heroes website. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but I think it's something that might be interesting for us in the UK as well to adopt. Um, so what we did, it was kind of a mixture of learning from the past and looking to the future. So uh, we, the learning from the past section was about listening to communities and network companies and gathering data from existing systems. And then looking forward, we were doing some modeling to look at how uh, new models could be developed, some real world testing of those, and then information exchange across Europe, which has actually been one of the really useful parts of this project uh, and policy recommendations coming out of the other end. So that learning from the past section, we had a big stakeholder engagement part, which is about listening to both communities and network companies. And thanks to anyone who's involved in, in chipping into that. Um, really to understand the challenges from both sides, but also then to identify good practice. And we have found some really interesting examples, both here in the UK and, and uh, across Europe. And then the monitoring was to get real world PV performance data, but also then how that relates to the on-site demand and what is the level of utilization across a bunch of different projects. So, and, and I mean, these included all sorts of, all sorts of different projects, really. Some uh, uh, in, um, there was one in Greece that is a 1.6 megawatt roof mounted that's on an enormous canopy um, on the top of the building, which is a yeah, pretty, um, pretty impressive thing. So then the looking to the future aspect of the, the project is um, really then about uh, we developed, or our Spanish partners developed, a Excel-based modeling tool for us to be able to play around with different scenarios, both um, from existing PV projects and then some new ones, and test out how does better on-site utilization um, affect the overall business model. So using more of the electricity direct on-site, and how does different levels of power purchase agreement affect it, and um uh also then looking at you know is it through demand response or, or, or batteries that you're improving the utilization um so uh, paul will talk a little bit more about that later and then we did a little bit of real world testing as i said with with some projects in development to see uh how that worked and what we could learn from it and then the information exchange part is is partly these webinars and we do have uh some more eu level webinars coming up on the 1st, 8th and 15th of July, uh, which again, everyone is welcome to, uh, and those will focus. The first one is will, gives a bit more detail than we're gonna go into today about um, the project and its findings, uh, and then has a discussion session. The one on the 8th is very much about policy. So we're, we're kind of targeting that at policymakers, but also relevant to anyone who is engaged with, with kind of policy advocacy. Um, and the one on the 15th is the one where we're going to be sharing the side of experience that's more directly useful to communities who are developing PV. So, you know, examples of interesting applications and how they worked and that kind of thing. Uh, and then we're also very active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and, and the euheroes.eu website is, is what we use to, to disseminate. Our policy recommendations I'll talk about at the end. Um, some of the things we learned, a lot of common challenges across Europe, uh, a lot of other countries have had similar challenges to us in the UK around sudden changes in, in subsidy regimes leading to marginal economics uh, and that kind of uncertainty generally on, on regulation and policy. Everybody is going through the, the process of uh, changing regulations to take account of um, smart distributed low carbon energy. Uh, there are a lot of concerns across Europe actually um, Regulators across Europe, in particular, concerned about equity of grid charging and, and you know everybody paying a fair price for the grid for grid access, uh, and actually community network, the communications between communities and network operators um, is a challenge across Europe. Um, so then, 
but at the same time we've got a bunch of common opportunities so the project very much underlined the value of on-site use and PPAs and and uh, put some evidence base behind that as well um, we know that the economics of PV are improving particularly at scale uh, the rapid development of storage um, and actually those regulatory changes you know if some of these things could create the right environment then that could be huge for peer-to-peer -peer supply and local supply and other countries have also have the kind of regulatory sandboxes like the one that Ofgem's put in place where there's the opportunity in a in a kind of controlled environment to try things that would perhaps be beyond the normal bounds of, of current regulation uh, and the other interesting thing is that there is kind of an emerging more consistent policy framework at EU level you know you might have heard lots about the EU Green Deal and, and and this there does seem to be a real effort across EU from the Commission to try to join up different areas of policy around the climate emergency and try to make a, a, a serious response I mean obviously the European Commission is being lobbied from all sorts of different directions so uh, policy there are many challenges with policy but you know, we've really noticed there is an effort here to try to create a, a more consistent policy framework, which is really encouraging. Uh, and the other thing we learned is that the community energy sector is actually really diverse across Europe. Um, it's not the same across all countries. There's a definitely a diversity of scales. Some countries it really hasn't developed yet, but also the diversity in terms of its nature. So some of the countries that we've in the, certainly in the early stages of development in community energy in the UK that we've looked to, some of those are much more, it's kind of large scale institutional social enterprises that then um, worked on renewables, whereas the UK is much more grassroots community social enterprise um, and quite unique in that way, I think. Uh, and, and other countries, the development of community energy is probably gonna come more through kind of mun municipal led social enterprise. Um, so that was that was really interesting. So the outputs from the project, we do now have some uh, performance and utilization data sets from these um, sites that we looked at. There, uh, that data, at least the majority of it, we're aiming to try to make public where where we've got people's permission to do that because we know those data sets can be useful to provide the, the, the kind of evidence base behind all of this. Um, it's something the Commission's asked us for. Uh, we, have, we have a bank of case studies and pilots and in the UK we're going to try and produce a few more of those just because you know we've come across so many interesting projects we're going to try and produce some sort of quite easily digestible case studies of interesting projects which we'll post on the project website but we'll also make sure those are available through community energy england and community energy wales scotland um, the excel based tool that paul will talk about in a minute um, we hope that might be of use to some of you it was developed for the project and it was developed to work across seven different european countries so you know that obviously means there's certain complications because people have different uh, regulatory and, and financial regimes um, but we think actually it could be useful if you're you know if you want to check out the showstoppers on a, 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 a PV project before you're then going to, to full feasibility it seems like a, a useful tool to do that um, I've mentioned the policy recommendations already but one of the really interesting things that I think is coming out of this is it's an opportunity for us in the UK to actually share experience back with Europe so a lot of the early development of community energy in the UK was inspired by projects in Europe, by you know kind of Netherlands and, and, and Germany and so on. Um, but actually, we found a huge amount of experience in the UK that uh, that is perhaps you know ahead in some cases of, of of what other countries are doing. And it's really timely, as I said, because of this change to the Renewable Energy Directive to incorporate support for uh, renewable energy communities all of the member states are currently they've either implemented it or they are in the process of implementing it and there is huge interest in the policy community around this i've, I've been along to a couple of meetings um, uh, energy saving trust does some work supporting um, with a network of other organizations kind of supporting policymakers across europe with implementing the european directives uh, and at that it was really surprising how many of these policymakers were actually really engaged 
with community energy and kind of scratching their heads about how to comply with this directive and what's the best you know how do we define community energy within our our regulatory regime what's the right structures to do how do we structure the incentives so that they can't be exploited so there is a real window of opportunity i think for community energy to be quite influential here um, and some of the areas in particular that we felt uk's got useful things to share certainly around innovative models and applications some of the projects that we've got here testing out peer-to-peer -peer approaches and those kind of things you know really pretty groundbreaking and you'll hear some interesting um, ones uh, this morning as well um, but also actually network operator to community relations in the UK are actually pretty good there's some really good examples and, and again this afternoon um, we'll look at that a little bit so we've got Jody from Regen and Regen have been very very active in this area I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the work that they do um, uh, we also have Helen Seagrave from um, Electricity Northwest, one of the DNOs, to talk. So there is, you know, whilst this has been a challenging area in the past, I think there's been some really good work done over the last few years to, to try to tackle that. Uh, and no doubt a lot of you have experienced that through the, the kind of um, support of some of the DNOs for Community Energy England as well. So um, lots, to, lots of positive stuff to share there. Um, and we're actually, we're not hearing much experience from our other partners across, across Europe. Um, of this kind of activity so we think there's some useful things to share there um, support schemes we quite keen to share our experience of the welsh and scottish programs because the article 22 does also include a requirement to put in place a, a supportive framework for um, community energy and also for countries to uh, monitor the development of it and do some research on the community energy sector um, in their area. So certainly the state of the sector survey is a really good example um, for the rest of Europe uh, about, about how to do that, how to capture the information and, and, and monitor it. And, and we feel that the um, Welsh government and Scottish government schemes have a really good range of different types of support available for communities. Uh, and uh, Jim Cardy, one of my colleagues from Energy Saving Trust, is going to talk about um, the Welsh Government programme in particular, but also the Scottish Government programme this afternoon and session this afternoon. And, and the last thing I think is community to community support. I mean, I guess we've all seen over the last few years the, the growth in particular of community PV that's been driven so much by just really good peer to peer support um, within the sector. Um, and, and I think that's you know a, a good news story that we could that we could share elsewhere that you know those models were developed and shared and kind of the open source approach has been really really positive across the sector. So I will just I'm conscious of time I will gallop through the policy recommendations uh, which are which are still kind of emerging so we, we we're getting some feedback from the webinars as well to to, to put into the final version of the policy recommendations. But we're kind of looking in the short term, how can we build the capacity of community energy to grab a decent chunk of the, the PV market as it becomes doable, um, subsidy free? And we certainly think that public sector, making public sector sites available with a PPA is something that could make a huge difference potentially um, if we can move more towards you know, standard roof lease approaches and standard PPAs that could have a huge impact. I know there's been a lot of talk about this over the last, over Community Energy Fortnight. Um, and I know there's a lot of complexity when that gets down to individual projects and, and maybe Dan might talk a little bit about that in his presentation about EGNI later on. Um, but we certainly think, you know, that's an area where national government and local authorities could really support around this. Um, then uh, I think there's, uh, an important bit about about consistency of support frameworks for community energy so article 22 is helping out with this but more more that could still be done around that um, we think there's maybe a case for targeted support for pv and batteries and definitely more more experience sharing across europe and i'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute and then the other side so that's the kind of short term how can we um, help the sector to build capacity now but in the longer term we think it's really important to recognize the role of PV in net zero, but also community energy in 
really delivering the economic and the social benefits of the transition as well. Um, getting the regulatory framework right for the smart, flexible approach um, and enabling local supply. Uh, in Across the rest of Europe, there's in a lot of areas, they feel that multifamily households are a huge opportunity. So particularly places like Lithuania and Poland, where they don't have so much of a community energy sector yet, but they've got huge numbers of residential blocks of flats. So they, they feel like there's a real opportunity there for them to develop the sector through communally owned PV on the block of fats. And so that that kind of local supply model is, is really important there. Um, we could do with some long-term certainty in um, on the direction of policy. Uh, and also we're kind of trying to highlight the potential role of shared ownership um, in achieving scale. Uh, a lot of the recommendations that we have are very much about trying to kind of grow the grassroots approach to, to community energy. But at the same time, we think there's probably an opportunity to sort of influence private sector deployment a little bit as well and get shared ownership models to, to um, open up community energy to more people. Um, so in the UK, um, I think uh, the it would be helpful if we could adopt um, the principles of Article 22 in the Renewable Energy in, Renewable Energy Directive, because that would be, you know, that is enshrining the right for community energy and it's um, enabling uh, fair treatment in the market. And actually, maybe that has some implications for smart export guarantee, um, because, you know, with the with the floor price of of, of zero there. Um, because the uh, article 22 is fairly clear about saying you know you should be paid a fair price a market price for your for your export um we think there's experience from from wales that could be shared on public procurement in particular the well-being of future generations act we've noticed has had a real influence on uh because it's trying to embed sustainability across welsh government policy it's had an influence on procurement and so we've we've been able to get a foot in the door with some quite big organizations around community energy because community energy just hits so many of the buttons on on sustainable development uh, and of course you know the public sector gets involved in some pretty good procurement pretty big procurements around things like the rail network um, and so uh, there's an opportunity there for to, to, to kind of support the growth of community energy um, and clarity on local supply and ultimately we're probably going to need a more progressive approach to network charging you know that it's often seen as a kind of a, an inherent barrier but the, the problem is the way we do network charging it's it's not progressive and, and that's what's creating this problem of you know if some people use the grid less they pay less in um, uh, which then means that potentially low-income people might have to pay more well there are ways of fixing that um, by dealing with having a more progressive method of network charging um, that's kind of the end of what I've got to say and I'm running out of time but I do just want to flag a couple of interesting um, policies that came up um, in the work that we were doing which was uh, from in particular from from Greece so in, in Greece there was um, they've implemented this article 22 they've put in they've defined what they mean by uh, community energy they've put in some kind of incentives um, some uh, special dispensation around kind of priority grid access and, and those kinds of things but the really interesting thing they've done is they've said we will allow virtual net metering but only for community energy um, now the challenge with that highlighted by our, our partners CRES in Greece um, is that actually their, their community energy sector isn't very well developed yet so nobody's done it although there's this fantastic opportunity there nobody's done it yet they are actually working with the community to try and be the first to, to implement one of these um, virtual net metering projects um, but it kind of feels like there's a real case there that if you could put that policy together with the kind of supportive framework that's available through something like CARES or the, the Welsh Government scheme, then you've got the support that helps new community uh, energy groups to set up, helps them with to get the governance structure in place through the feasibility, gives them the support to then be able to make use of that, that fantastic kind of policy framework. Um, 
there's got to be some great opportunities there. And I think that's going to be where a lot of the value of our policy recommendations is going to come from, is that we've actually got a bunch of these examples of really interesting policies. And nobody, nobody seems to have the whole picture yet. But there's this kind of jigsaw of if you took that policy from there and this policy from there and put them together, there's the makings of a really, really strong uh, policy framework there. Um, Lithuania are also doing some really interesting things on uh, virtual net metering as well. But also the other policy they've got is um, that local authorities must identify sites um, for community energy uh, on their on their estate. Um, which is yeah seem, seems really positive. It'd be great, great to have that here. We know that uh, Forum for the Future are doing some work on that through their Power Paired program, which um, we'll share a hyperlink for that later on. It's not not a government thing. There's no mandate to it, but they're trying to find organisations that have got sites available um, for community energy and match them up with community energy groups. So that's it from me. Uh, sorry, I've overrun slightly, but hopefully that was a useful um, intro. Uh, so I will now um, hand over to my colleague Paul, who's joined us on uh, working specifically on EU Heroes Energy Saving Trust. Um, Paul also has experience as a PV installer and uh, lots of experience as a as a consultant. So it's been really useful to have his technical input. So Paul's going to talk you through the um, uh, the tool that we've developed and hopefully how that might be useful to you. Uh, and maybe we can, what we'll do is just try and take some questions at the end, perhaps, um, uh, to pick up time. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Graham. Good morning, all. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, as Graham says, I'm um, relatively new to the uh, uh, EU uh, Heroes project um, and uh, very new to Energy Saving Trust as well. So I'm uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to speak with as much uh, uh, authority or clarity as Graham has, um, uh, but it's uh, it's been a uh, certainly a, an, an interesting uh, project for me to be involved with, um, as I've also had uh, limited experience of the community PV se sector throughout my career. Um, though, as Graham mentioned, I've been um, working in renewables and uh, principally PV for for uh, yeah a good a good while now. Um, uh, so yeah, really happy to have this opportunity to work with you all. I think there's a lot of um, you know, great energy, drive, commitment, um, passion uh, in the community sector that uh, perhaps uh, gets a little bit lost in some other elements of the, the, the PV industry. Um, so uh, yes, uh, we're really hopeful that, uh, that what we're doing through the EU Heroes project can have some uh, longer term value. Um, Graham touched upon one element of the project that we hope may have some um, direct value for um, uh, the. Um, oops, excuse me, scrolled up too far. Just to get it back on track. Um, one of the direct elements that we uh, we hope may have some uh, value for for community groups, um, particularly groups with relatively limited experience of PV project development themselves. Um, and that's the uh, the financial analysis tool, or I'll scroll back up, the tool for rapid economic analysis of PV business models, as it's catchily known. And if anyone's interested in how we came about the EU Heroes um, name, uh, it seems to be described in this bottom corner here. Um, tenuous, but uh, but there we go. We've got to find a find a, a link somehow. Um, so back to the uh, the issue in question. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to give you a presentation from my own desktop. I seem to, Michael. I think we seem to have lost the uh, the main presentation. So um, hopefully you can now see my screen, um, and I will put this in slideshow mode. Uh, so we can see what the tool is for. Um, okay, so what? <laughs> apologies for this. Uh, so what is the tool for? So it's really it's a it's a very high level assessment tool. Um, so we're not intending that it's going to be um, it's going to be something that uh, is of massive value to to experienced um, PV communities. Um, it's really for first exploration of um, uh, early stage projects 
and it allows some high level uh, assessment of um, various financial uh, analysis data. So you're able to control the input cost elements, obviously. Um, you're able to control the, um, if, if you like, the revenue streams that uh, that the uh, tool is able to um, uh, able to assess. And um, as a result, uh, we're going to uh, see some uh, output um, performance uh, estimates. But one of, one of the areas that you're able to do is is also um, undertake um, uh, instantaneous scenario testing. So there are a number of inbuilt. Um, rapid scenario tests available. Um, as I mentioned, relative, relatively early um, sta stage um, novice PV groups are the uh, the target audience in question. Um, and I think really what we're going to um, uh, we're going to see is that, that this is enabling um, groups that perhaps are a little bit unsure as to whether or not they've got a, a viable project. To, to do some self-screening, if you like, um, and particularly for, uh, for example, with uh, Energy Saving Trust um, involvement with Welsh Government Energy Saving, um, uh, Welsh Government Energy um, Scheme, and the Scottish Cares Project, which Jim, Jim's going to touch about uh, in more detail this afternoon. Um, we're anticipating that this could potentially be a, 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 a pre-screen tool for, um, a, for then further development by um, CARES and WGES, for example, and potentially also I think it could be of use to RCEF um, if, uh, if, if they're also looking to, uh, um, to steer uh, early stage community groups to, to really take a little bit of um, um, uh, self-involvement in the project. Uh, it's also particularly focused on building grid connected applications. So um, one of the inbuilt elements within the tool is uh, con consumption and uh, generation matching profiles. So um, you're able to, as we'll see in a moment, uh, either directly or um, with, uh, with a little bit of um, uh, uh, available um, pre-installed um, pre data, you can very rapidly um, generate uh, an indicative assessment of uh, um, building energy performance, for example, um, how much of the, the generated PV is used directly on site and how much may, may then be available for on sale or for, if you like, for, for further improvement, um, how you might be able to um, improve your self-consumption as it were. What it is not, it's not a PV system design tool, so we're not looking to, to help uh, community groups um, design a system. And it's, it's also, um, importantly, we should mention, it's not strong enough, um, not robust enough, uh, in our view, to be a financial due diligence tool. So it's certainly not something that you're going to be able to take to the bank and say, I've done the due diligence and, uh, yeah, please um, finance my project. However, um, yes, it, it, it certainly gives some indication um, which we've been attempting to validate alongside the tools, the other tools that we're using in-house. Um, and that will, that will then enable um, potentially uh, groups, if, if they feel that there is a business case, to take it to the next stage for, for, for the development assistance. And I, I should also mention that we're due to host a small number of training sessions over the next couple of months. So if you'd like to learn more after this presentation, then please do contact us directly. Um, so what I'm going to do now is really a rapid fire pass through uh, what, what the tool is about, um, where you can obtain it very briefly, how you can use it. So this is the EU Heroes website, www.euheroes.eu. And you're able to access the tool um via uh, the the online portal um it's uh it is one of those um uh we're at the stage at the moment that we're looking to try and um uh provide the very latest updated version of the tool we've recently had some validation updates um we've got a brand new manual this should be going live today um, however, I don't believe that it's up there as of this moment in time. So if you if you um, would uh, care to uh, check back, probably in about 24 hours time, we should have the updated version of the tool online. Um, and if you click on the tool, 
um, what you'll see is a link to the financial model itself, um, which is an Excel file. Um, so a very familiar interface for, for those of you who are using uh, Excel for your modeling purposes. Um, but also there is a, a newly updated user manual, um, which again, um, EST have spent quite a lot of time trying to improve, make more understandable and more user friendly, um, so that um, that actually the, the, the tool in combination with the manual is something now we feel that, that community groups can pick up, um, understand themselves and, and try and make a first, uh, first stab at um, uh, their, their own um, project investigation. So yes, so manual um, and Excel file, um, these are the two items that you're going to be, um, be able to download from the website. Looking at the, at the tool interface in more detail, it's really a very straightforward um, Excel interface, no particular bells or whistles. I mean, there's a little bit of color coding. So we've got um, various input um, input sheets. Uh, majority of the, the key data is on the, 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 the very first um, input page. Um, as you'll see, I'll, I'll step through that in a moment. So you've got a, a number of highlighted uh, cells in various colors. The yellow cells are the, um, the uh, user input um, cells. There are a number of um, validation cells in green, um, some suggestions in the gray cells as to what you might want to include in, in, the, um, uh, in the, the user input boxes. Uh, and red cells uh, provide a, um, an indication of either scenario data that's been drawn um, from elsewhere in, in the file um, or instantaneously generated data. Um, so uh, in essence, what you'll do as a first stage is to select your country, obviously UK. Um, we then got an option to, to select by region. Um, uh, that will then uh, give you uh, an estimate of the expected uh, annual specific system yield um, based on a, a PVGIS generic data for the for the, for the region. Now, obviously, most of you are going to want something a little bit more detailed than that. Um, the tool, as I mentioned, doesn't um, allow this directly in, in internally, um, but. Obviously, there are existing tools that are available for that. PVGIS being one, for example, that we would recommend um, users to users to approach. Um, the other element that we that we would um, be looking to understand is the general consumption of the load of the the, the um, building or plant that the generator is going to be attached to. Um, and the consumption data here is really only um, used for describing um, electricity bands, so for suggestions lower down in the tool as to um, what value for um, price of electricity you might be looking to in, in, incorporate if you don't have that um, information readily to hand. Uh, so if I click that through the next few stages, so I'll fill in a few of those. Um, we, we've got an opportunity um, to directly input the annual consumption, installation system tie, lifetime um, expected system size, and um, um, anticipated degradation of panels. Uh, some of those, as we say, um, you've got um, uh, default inputs that you might like to include. Um, importantly, as I mentioned, you can incorporate your own uh, specific system yield, PVGIS being the tool for that, we recommend. Um, and then otherwise, it's a case of inputting your um, indicative uh, specific system cost data. So, uh, for example, um, we'd be looking at somewhere in the order of £800 per kilowatt hour at the present time, um, for, per kilowatt, excuse me, for um, um, initial investment costs. Um, you can, if you're able to access uh, an upfront grant, you can incorporate that within your um, um, investment costs to reduce the amount of um, uh, uh, CapEx um, finance that you're going to need to pursue. Um, so this, uh, based on the specific system cost, um, size of the system, um, is, is going to um, provide you with a, an applied system cost, which is 
feeding through from the scenario pages. Uh, fixed annual OPEX is going to be based on a percentage of your applied um, system costs, um, but you again have the option to entirely um, put in the values that you see fit in those in those um, operation and maintenance costs. Similar um, similar page for the the, the, the funding scheme. Uh, so looking at the the debt and equity um, contributions of the uh, the, the input. Uh, project finance right here we go uh, so um, uh, debt equity balance can be incorporated directly or fairly fairly simply by the uh, by the user so if you're aware of um, uh, cost of finance from the bank um, that can readily be input um, into uh, the, the the debt element equity is based on the uh, the debt uh, contribution uh, and the cost of the project. So, um, if you if you have a a, a debt um, deficit, for example, if you need to make up uh, your project finance from a source other than debt, then the default is that it's going to be coming from from equity, your own equity. Um, in this case, obviously, we've got a, um, a debt contribution matching the the, the project value, um, and so we, we we don't need any equity. Um, but there is the opportunity to incorporate that with a different cost of debt, if you so wish. Um, somewhat lower down the, the the page, we're looking at the business model scheme. So there are a number of um, business models, some of which are relevant to the UK, some of which are not uh, currently relevant to the UK, or once were and no longer are. Um, reason for that is obviously we've been in incorporating seven different countries um, uh, financial um, schemes within this uh, uh, this tool and it's it, it's really designed as a uh, as a tool that can be used by um, by any of the EU partner countries indeed any of the EU countries um, with a little bit of tweaking um, and uh, so a number of these may or may not be relevant but for example self-consumption you can directly input um, information on the uh, the, the amount of um, building consumption. It's worthwhile actually opening up the self-consumption element because that does give you access to uh, some of the um, uh, uh, some of the information that you may need further down the line for power purchase agreements, etc. Which is probably going to be one of the ones that is most relevant to UK audiences. Um, so we're going to look at PPA briefly in a little bit more detail. We can select power purchase agreement. Um, we then have an opportunity uh, to open up and expand um, the, the content here, looking a little bit at um, input electricity rates, so the, the PPA supply rate, the, the, the rate that you're agreeing to supply to your customer, um, the, the rate, uh, excess electricity rate um, component um, that you will anticipate um, uh, for sale of electricity beyond um, beyond the PPA price so so if, if you generate more than your customer is expecting you may have a different um, uh, agreement rate and likewise if you undersupply there may be a, 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 a component for for um, um, undersupply of, um, uh, of, of power purchase uh, there are a number of opportunities, as Graham briefly mentioned, for for uh, analysing self-consumption. These are really very simple, um, looking at the um, uh, possibility of incorporating um, battery, for example, um, uh, on an assumed uh, energy cost of battery storage. Uh, that will then allow you to, to, to potentially optimise your your on-site self-consumption and test the, the, um, the financial performance of the, the, the project as a result. One of the more interesting elements, I think, is, is as I mentioned, the opportunity to incorporate um, uh, both consumption and uh, generation profiles, specifically for the, the, the um, application in question. Uh, on the consumption side, you have the opportunity to incorporate um, residential elements, um, either single or multiple family houses, um, commercial buildings, um, public sector buildings and industrial buildings um, profiles of the default um, consumptions are, um, are based on Eurostat um, uh, information. 
um, you may also decide that, that actually you don't have that data to hand. Uh, and there is a possibility um, really just to use the, the um, in-house, uh, the inbuilt um, default data um, by selecting a, a, a relative consumption of um, residential um, or commercial uh, component. Uh, that then will quickly generate some um, consumption data, which then you can, if you're so inclined, um, look to match more directly with your your on-site generation. Um, as I, as I mentioned, it's it's not essential that you that you incorporate this this information. There are um, inbuilt generation profiles as well. So by the per, uh, um, selection of the building type, um, that will uh, that will um, describe the consumption profile. And based on your location, um, the production profile will be will be automatically generated if you don't have this um, um, site specific data to hand. Uh, subsequently, you will see there is a sensitive sensitivity analysis opportunity. So you can very quickly look at elements such as um, uh, effect of uh, increasing electricity price, um, uh, power purchase agreement variations, um, if your um, OPEX costs increase or indeed your um, uh, capital costs increase. Um, the system price, for example, and the debt to debt to equity ratio as well. Uh, those are all possible to very quickly analyze on a percentage basis um, with with a number of um, charts uh, as a result um, generated from that uh, that that process. Uh, and the final um, output is is then effectively an, an overview page, which um, uh, includes all of the information that you've previously input and the the, um, the, the output elements of the, the the project. Looking at a um, effectively the the MPV um, uh, project rate of return um, and other key uh, other key parameters. That's a really a very rapid. Um, overview of the tool. I apologize for the um, the technical problems that we had early on in, in the presentation. Hopefully those are going to be resolved for, um, for, for subsequent speakers. Um, in a nutshell, as I mentioned, it's high-level pre-screening, it's scenario testing. Um, it is freely available to download from, from the website and there is now a user manual which is also readily available. Give it um, 24 hours, but that should be available, as I mentioned, on the, um, the EU website. Um, uh, and if you would like further uh, further support to to use the tool, if you're at an early stage yourself and you're you're, you're looking to, um, to to investigate a project uh, and you would like a little bit more help than I've, uh, I've provided here this morning, uh, we do have some available during the project timeframe. So um, uh, feel free to, to to contact us, um, and we we'll certainly um, be, be happy to discuss with you whether there's an opportunity to incorporate you in in the uh, uh, the training program. Thanks, Paul. Hi. Um oh, sorry, go on, Graham. Yeah. No, no, carry on, Michael. That's fine. I, I was just going to, I may well have been saying what you were going to say, Graham. Um, yeah, thank you for that, um, Paul. And obviously, uh, once again, apology for any uh, technical issues we had uh, during that presentation. But we seem to be sort of up and running okay now. Um, unfortunately, we seem to be missing um, Dan McCallum from Egni Co op. Um, so, unfortunately, um, we're not going to be able to hear from Dan at this point, so I think it might be best sort of we move on to our next presenter, who is uh, Graham Bolton from um, Energy Saving Trust. It's Graham there at the minute. Um, uh, just while Graham's getting sorted out, as we've suddenly bumped him up the order. Um, uh, thanks, Paul. That was good. Uh, and as Paul said. Um, we think that tool is kind of useful if you're checking out a site um, for PV. Um, good opportunity to just test out, you know, what sort of what do different levels of PPA, uh, what effect do they have on the on the model and those kind of things. And that I think that's personally, I think that sensitivity analysis uh, page is quite useful because whilst it's possible to do all of this stuff anyway that page makes it kind of quite visible what impact does it have if you're 
power purchase agreement that you get is kind of you know 10% above or 10% below or uh, and also for the price and I think this might be an interesting one working with potentially local authorities and public sectors um, it's public sector organizations um, the uh, that, that you might actually be able to then kind of have, have a discussion with a local authority that says okay well it you know it looks like PV is pretty tricky to do right now but actually if the capital cost comes down by x percent then it becomes doable and actually you know the long-term trends in the industry are that maybe that could happen within two years or so so is it something that they could put into the capital program for next year or the year after so some i think some interesting things that you can play around with there the other thing to note is that we will do we do plan to do another webinar um specifically around using the tool where we would just kind of work through a live example so if people are interested in that uh let us know uh, and we can we can get you on the list for um to take part in that uh, are, you, are you there now graham are you yes sorted? yes i i am here yes uh, i was thanks. muted um thanks graham thanks for thanks for stepping into the breach and yes. I'll, I'll leave it to you graham, graham bolton's one of my colleagues who uh at energy saving trust again um, but graham works on the uh scottish power energy network's green economy fund and I'll, I'll leave him to to talk about that and he's going to talk you through one of the projects that they've supported thanks graham thank you michael and uh good morning everyone thanks for for joining us for this webinar as graham mentioned uh my name's Graham Bolton and I work on the SP Energy Network's Green Economy Fund project uh, and I'm joining you today to talk about one of our uh, projects which has a, a large PV aspect uh, called the Civic House Passive Warehouse Project. Uh, Michael, if you could go on to the next slide, please. We, I noticed in the comments that people were asking for contact details, so that is my email address there. Uh, so. Uh, if we we are unable to answer any of your questions, or if you want to speak to me directly, that's my my contact details. So please feel free to to drop me an email if you have any questions on the fund or on the project that I'm speaking about. Uh, one caveat with my pres presentation is um, I we are the funders of this project, so uh, I'm not part of the actual project itself. So if you do have any questions uh, which I'm unable to answer or any of my colleagues are unable to answer, we will take those away uh, and pass them back to the project to get them answered. Okay, well, Wiley, if you guys can just have a go at fixing that. Um... We, we have got quite a few questions actually uh, that it would be good um, to pick up on. Uh, we've got some in the questions tab, we've had some um, kind of written answers to questions. Um, let me just go through a couple of these. Uh, so there was um, uh, one from uh, Chris, Ro Chris Rowland highlighting that um actually as the community energy sector has matured it's skilled up uh, so it has the ability to bridge the gap between community energy dnos and local authorities and i would absolutely agree with that i think you know the uk uh community energy sector is is really strong and we've been quite conscious of that in the work that we've done on on eu heroes uh and so we've always kind of tried to involve some of the community groups that are more advanced on this and and be supporting the the groups that aren't as experienced at that yet um but i think that's that's part of what i think we can actually share back with europe is um you know where where this has actually worked really well because of um work within the community energy sector work that that Regen have been doing, that some of the network operators have been doing, and, and that's something that we'll pick up on a little bit more um, this afternoon, uh, particularly when we hear from um, from Jody and from uh, um, Helen at uh, Electricity Northwest, Helen Seagrave. Um, <clears throat> there is a little update on the uh, local electricity bill if anybody's interested in that that's that's going forward very relevant to all of this um, and Jack who's joining us from our policy team has just um, put a response in there on the latest on, on where that is um, there's also uh, Jack has posted the hyperlink to the um, renewable energy directive in there as well if anybody wants to click through and, uh, and have a look at that um, 
uh, and Philip has asked, uh, Philip Selwood, hi Philip, um, has asked, does EU Heroes cover the community benefits of vehicle to grid? So that's certainly one of the technologies that's kind of there in the suite of um, uh, approaches. Uh, we've we haven't kind of done specific work on it other than that i think there may have been some vehicle to grid in the mix for some of the the models that we've been supporting um certainly in the, in the stuff that we've done in the uk uh it's something that we're quite conscious of and also i i believe that there's some looking into this through um, some of the work that we're doing on cares and the welsh government scheme uh, but it's absolutely right to, to kind of highlight that there is a really good opportunity and in fact there was a, a news article yesterday or the day before i think highlighting uh, some research that was saying how much could have been saved um, during the pandemic and the lockdown for the pandemic had we had kind of board uh, because obviously we've had this issue with kind of low low demand and high very high pv and, and, and wind generation um, and how much difference uh, vehicle to grid could have made to that so yeah that's a a good point to raise um someone that looks said promising moving them. <laughs> i'm not sure okay. who i think paul possibly but yeah great. Yep, that's me We're... i'm in control I will... I will hand back. I will hand back to Graham then. But thanks. It's good. Good to have the opportunity. There, there's some more questions here as well that we'll try and pick up at the end if we have time. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. If you're okay to carry on, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Fine. Not a, not a problem, Graham. Uh, yeah. As I said, just um, to some development for for the Green Economy Fund, which the Energy Saving Trust. Uh, we are the administrators of the fund on behalf of SPNG Networks, um, who are a distribution transmission. Uh, network operator um, and they supply electricity to and from around it's around 3.5 million homes and businesses over their network um, mainly covers sort of central and southern Scotland but they do have uh, distribution areas in parts of North Wales and Merseyside etc uh, for the green economy fund they voluntarily uh, decided to contribute uh, it is a total budget of 20 million pounds over a two-year period uh, which ends in march 2021 in line with their network spending uh, window and uh, that is to run a, a very broad range of, of projects which which will help enhance and support the the green economy um, on free free sort of basic themes of, of transport uh, majority of that being uh, supplying EVs to uh, a variety of organisations from commercial to uh, community transport organisations, uh, education projects uh, such as one where we are providing uh, colleges uh, with funding to purchase equipment to train the next generation of apprentices, uh, but also more traditional sort of renewable and low carbon technology projects such as uh, community hydro, micro hydro schemes, um, and also PV projects as well. Uh, so we're working with Local Energy Scotland to install lots of community PV. Next slide, please. Uh, I will say for, for the Green Economy Fund, all of the money has been uh, allocated um, to projects. So there is no funding available and there won't be any future funding rounds for, for the Green Economy Fund. Um, that's just a list of the priorities of the fund, which, which I won't, won't run through now. Um, but there is a hyperlink to the bottom as well, which uh, provides a lot more detail on the fund um, and where you can find out some more information about what we've been up to. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. Uh, it's the, yeah, that's the one. Uh, so the applicant, uh, the person running the project is an organization called Agile City. They are a community interest company um, and their remit is they explore inclusive city development. Uh, so they aim to create space for work events, learning um, through the repurposing of industrial buildings uh, and addressing uh, the issues of vacant space. They are based in Glasgow and they've got two sites in Glasgow. The one that we are providing funding for is a building called Civic House. Uh, which has been operating as a workspace and a venue. It also has a canteen where organizations can uh, bring in an, their own food and catering for events. Uh, it's located in an area of Glasgow called uh, Spears Locks, uh, which is in North Glasgow. Uh, if you know Glasgow, that's just north of the uh, M8 motorway. 
uh, it is located in an area of high uh, deprivation so it's in the bottom five percent of the Scottish index of multiple deprivation uh, it's an area that's been very hard to hit uh, with the loss of industry uh, and also the construction of the the M8 in the 1960s as well um, which which impacted the local area it is a uh, a key gateway site that the Scottish government's identified and is part of a wider regeneration project um, which would include the building of, of about 1500 homes and the Scottish government are looking to make the area a more attractive place to live work and visit. The building itself is a, a two-story brick construction with generous ceiling heights and great natural light. I'm trying not to sound like an estate agent here but if anyone wants to put an offer that's fine. Uh, it's, uh, but like most of these buildings, they are uh, very solidly built, but they have an incredibly low environmental performance and they are very expensive to heat and maintain. But they are commonplace, especially in uh, post-industrial cities such as Glasgow. So they tend to lie derelict. Um, Agile City were able to acquire the building uh, in November 2016. Uh, and that was with uh, Scottish government funding that enabled them to do that. The, uh, the sort of tagline for the project, uh, if you're able to go on to oh, yeah. the, the next slide, Paul, which, yeah, the one with the Google view, uh, is they're aiming to create Scotland's first retrofit passive warehouse um, project. Uh, these stats, these are taken directly from the project's application is, uh, if you're able to go up, one slide, thanks Paul. Uh, they are aiming to reduce the heat, heat demand for the building by 86%. Um, and in terms of, and make significant reductions in CO2. Uh, the wider project itself, I will talk in more detail about the PV projects, so the solar array, but there are, uh, they're doing external wall insulation works the building itself, if you can see on the Google map picture that I have there, it's the building in the center of the picture, just to the right of, of that road there. Uh, it has windows along both sides of the building. Um, so they will replace those with triple glazing. Uh, they're gonna put in mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. Uh, there will also be an electric battery, which will be partnered up with the solar and also a heat battery as well, and uh, further passive works in terms of air tightness um, as part of a wider thermal improvement upgrade to uh, the building. That is uh, that is a view with uh, of the building, so uh, the roofs face uh, west and east as you're looking at the building there. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. The installation of PV, they aim for it to generate uh, 50 kilowatt hours, uh, 50 kilowatts, uh, sorry, peak, uh, and provide about 33,000 uh, kilowatt hours of energy per year. And they believe that will offset 11 tonnes of CO2 compared to electricity taken from the grid. Uh, those figures were worked out at the time of application a couple of years ago, so they may have changed since then. Uh, the picture that you're you're seeing there, that is of the east uh, aspect of the roof, um, which has slightly less panels, and I'll explain that in my next slide. It has slightly less panels than the western aspect, just because it has uh, trees that run alongside, so shade the roof, uh, especially in summer. The total generation surface is just under 270 meters squared. Uh, they have put 158 uh, modules onto the roof, and um, as I said there, it will be just under 50 kilowatts peak um, that the system will generate. Next slide, please, Paul. OK, this is uh, just stats for, for the, uh, the, the roof area. So uh, as I said, the eastern area is a bit more shaded. Uh, so they've only put 36 uh, of the modules onto that roof. Uh, whereas the western side of the, the roof is, is not overlooked. So they've got 122 uh, modules running across the roof. It's about three uh, modules um, 
from the top to the bottom of the roof along and uh, that's got quite a, a large surface area of, of just over 200 meters squared for generation. Next slide please. So uh, system has very recently been commissioned, uh, commissioned on the 20th of March. That was to meet the, what at the time was the uh, feed-in tariff deadline of the end of March. Uh, that has since been extended by six months, but the, the project worked hard to, to make sure they met that deadline and got their install done. Uh, they are planning to use the, the sort of feed-in tariff, the subsidy that they received to help pay back other loans that they've got for uh, as part of the wider project. Uh, the majority of the energy generated will be used on site, and that will be supported, as I said, in conjunction with uh, the battery storage that I have on site. Uh, they believe it will cover most of the building's needs, but they will, any surplus generation, they will export that um, to the grid. I was able to speak to the project manager yesterday, which was very handy, uh, and he read the generation meter for me. So he said, since this, the, the system's been commissioned, it's uh, generated 13,177 kilowatt hours. Uh, no doubt benefiting from the recent good lockdown weather that we've all been. Uh, experiencing. Next slide please Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, so how's this project been funded? Uh, we are one of the big funders. We are providing uh, capital funding for not just the PV but other uh, measures that are being installed as part of the project. They've also benefited from uh, Scottish government money in terms of regeneration capital grant funding which helped them purchase the building. Uh, the Scottish Government Cl Climate Challenge Fund have uh, provided funding as well as uh, Resource Efficient Scotland via their SME loan programme uh, and also Resilient Scotland as well have all uh, contributed to the, the funding package for this project. Uh, next slide please Paul. Okay, uh, and I'll just briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, just briefly touch on other sources of funding uh, for community PV in Scotland. Um, so our colleague Jim will cover uh, CARES a bit later on, uh, the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. Uh, that provides enablement grants of up to 25,000 for uh, various aspects of feasibility work for community groups. They also uh, provide development loans and innovation grants, um, which go up to 150k, although that hasn't been confirmed for this next spending year. So uh, keep an eye on the local Energy Scotland website um, for announcements on that. And also uh, please look at the local Energy Scotland website because they have lots of information about what funding is available to community groups, uh, guidance on what, who and what is eligible, and they also have a template project proposal forms that you can complete and send to them and they can contact and help um, your project with uh, in terms of funding and uh, direction. Um, other sources of funding that community groups are able to use, so private funds, so the Green Economy Fund is one that could be classed as private funds, so organisations may uh, release grant funding that you're able to bid into. Um, keep an eye out for community benefit funds, particularly within your, your local areas. Um, there may be funds that from large scale generation such as wind farm or hydro schemes where there are pots of money available um, for you to utilize. Um, SME loans are talked about resource efficient Scotland. Um, organizations use can use their own reserves as well. Um, but community groups also do things such as community share offerings or selling of community bonds. Uh, crowdfunding has become recently very popular for community projects. It's a, it's a good way to, to raise uh, money, uh, but also other fundraising efforts as well. So uh, gala days or similar charity events and the Green Economy Fund, we fund uh, some care, we help support some CARES projects such as uh, installing PV on schools. So the schools uh, have run fundraising gala days to, to provide a bit more funding. Um, just a final point from me, this isn't really a community point, but just a, a, for any uh, people listening, uh, domestic property owners, uh, if you live in Scotland, uh, the Energy Saving Trust uh, 
also deliver Home Energy Scotland on behalf of the, the Scottish Government. Um, and if you are looking to install PV on your house, uh, they provide interest-free loans funded by the Scottish Government uh, if you wished to do that. Um, that's everything from me. Sorry it was a bit rushed, Graham, but that's everything from me. Uh, I will uh, let the next presenter to join us, but I will be available uh, to help out and answer questions uh, just before lunch. That's fine. Thanks. Thanks for that, Graham. That's good. Um, <clears throat> hopefully we'll have time um, for questions at the end, um, having a look at those. Um, I can see that we've got uh, Dan in the call now. Um, I'm just going to unmute you, Dan, see if um, we're OK audio wise. Otherwise, we'll just go to Ben. OK, so you should be unmuted now, Dan. Are you happy to do your your presentation now? Uh, yeah, if you can you hear me, uh, Graham. Yeah, you're coming through fine. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Great. Okay, so I'll hand over Dan McCallum. No doubt, Dan will be known to to many of you, but he's going to talk a bit about uh, Egni Co-op's um, experience of PV projects and some really interesting stuff to share. So uh, thanks for joining us, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Um, just, just picking up actually um, on that on the presentation about sort of share offers and and crowdfunding. You know, so I um work for our alum tower but just looking at our first slide actually it's kind of the, the sort of marketing of these things is really important so we, we took quite a lot of time one of our volunteers actually designed the, the, the sort of um the image on the on the front of our share offer document and and the adverts we've kind of put quite a lot of adverts out there but it's it's definitely really helped i think um sort of when we've raised sort of 1.9 million pounds so far um Yes, yeah, so the presentation of community energy is, is really important. Um, OK, but just stepping back. So I, I work for Our Lamb and Tower. It's a charity. We've set up two um, co-ops, um, uh, a wind farm called Owl Co-op, which has been generating since 2017, and Egni Co-op, um, which is the sort of subject of this presentation, which installs rooftop um, solar in, in Wales. Uh, can you click to the next slide, slide please? Or can I do that? No. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of background to us. Um, yeah, the wind farm was a long, long saga that some of you probably know about. Uh, I won't dwell on that. <laughs> um, but the, it has really sort of underlined the kind of credibility of, of, of us in terms of um, then enabling us to kind of develop other, other, other projects. Um, and you know, it's, it, you know, we spent a lot of time over the years kind of really struggling to convince people that we were credible. Um, and so I do feel for projects which sort of, you know, are perhaps less lucky and get turned down for things. Um, and but anyway, since that wind farm has been generating, it's sort of enabled us to develop a lot of other projects, especially um, to expanding Egni um, and sort of helping to underwrite some of the risk that that, that we had on in 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 expanding Egni. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so that's that's our wind farm uh, above above Pontadawa in South Wales. It's on common land, so anyone can visit it. Um, yeah, it's very beautiful. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, and this just sort of all the kind of awards that we've won. Um, again, it helps with raising awareness of share offers to sort of apply for these awards. And I'll I'll be blunt. A lot of this is just copying and pasting from different awards. But you know, I, I certainly we certainly found that the publicity that this sort of thing generates really helps share offers so i would urge community energy groups to apply apply for any awards going because it's basically free marketing um next slide please um and it's just quite interesting the development of the whole industry we've we've been around for a long time since sort of well we started looking at the wind farm in literally 1998 um and then one of the first sort of projects that we did after that was um, 16 kilowatts on the local school, um, Gwanka Gadawen, um, which was installed in Gwanka in, in 2004. And at, at that point, 16 kilowatts, it was the biggest <laughs> rooftop solar project in Wales. And I'll, I'll mention Gwanka Gadawen, you, you'll never, well, a lot of people probably won't have heard of it, but it is famous village because Gareth Edwards, who's sort of widely thought of as the best rugby player of all time, uh, was born in Gwanka Gadawen. So that's its claim to fame. Um, but we have sort of expanded Egni a lot, um, especially in the past year. We we pre-registered a lot of sites for the feed-in tariff, and since um, uh, sort of September, October last year, we've been installing and actually we've installed 2.4 megawatts on um, 
uh, roofs throughout Wales, mainly in schools, businesses, community centres. Um, uh, and I think now that the government's extended the feed-in tariff, we're looking to try and install up to another megawatt before the end of September. Um, obviously, taking advantage of the feed-in tariff and some of the other very helpful sort of um, points of that, like deemed export on sub-30 kilowatt systems, which are really helpful on some of the smaller community sites. Um, and on those smaller community buildings, we're basically offering free, we've offered free electric to them, partly because the hassle of trying to bill for relatively small amounts of energy is just too great. It's just not worth it. Um, but also, obviously, it, it helped it will help their sustainability. A lot of those community buildings are kind of now the focus of efforts to tackle the, the COVID um, outbreak. Um, so this is that's kind of one of the community benefits that we're providing through the model. Um, and the, the share of has been has been very successful, um, and we've also been sort of backed, supported by the Development Bank of Wales, which is a sort of particular loan fund um, drawing on money from Welsh government to support community energy in Wales, um, and that's been really helpful. I'm not I'm not aware of anything similar in England. Um, I think Scotland has got similar models, but it's you know very very helpful. Um, certainly for our scheme and a number of other community energy projects in Wales to have that kind of dedicated source of support specifically for the sector um, and which is prepared to take a bit of more risk um, than a commercial, you know, a, let's say commercial, you know, sort of traditional bank finance might look at. Um, next slide, please. So it was a, it's been, you know, challenging. Um, the key thing for us was getting a couple of new staff. Um, Rosie Gillam, uh, who used to work for Community for Fenian Renewables in the Southwest, and um, Alex um, Ferraro. Um, so they they've kind of driven the expansion of Egni, um, and you know they they both had a sort of strong background in renewables. Um, so that that's been critical. Um, and they they were largely grant funded as well um, from European funds, uh, rural development program funds, and again that again it sort of helped reduce the sort of risk and the expenditure of the project, and um, it was, has been very useful. Um, procurement was one of the big challenges. Um, a lot of the sites that we pre-registered were with local authorities, and the issue then was you know how. How do local authorities sort of demonstrate that they're getting best value and also that they're kind of in line with sort of procurement legal guidelines? Um, and they took they took different views on that. Um, um, but especially Newport Council, um, you know, the procurement people looked at it and just felt, well, this organization, EGNI, has secured the feed-in tariff. They're in an advantageous position. And we've got climate targets to reach by 2030. So um, they felt basically that they had to advertise it, but on the basis of, of giving a direct award to EGNI to deliver the, the project. So people were able to challenge that direct award via the sort of Welsh Government website. Um, and there were a couple of queries that came back, but um, you know, it basically they were happy with that process and it went ahead. Um, but going forward, subsidy free, it is going to be difficult, I think, for community energy to compete um, in the kind of standard procurement framework, unless there is some sort of weighting or guidance given to to support kind of community energy. Um, yeah, there are various portals. You know, the Crown procurement Crown services have a kind of a a portal in which you can register for procurement and that's something that the EGNI will have to look at um, but my sense is, is that whole system is much much better set up for really large companies like British Gas or whoever to kind of be on there and from those portals local authorities can select um, directly um, installers um, so I, I, I don't know the answers around procurement but I think it is a key key issue for kind of how Community energy interacts with local authorities. We we have found various local authorities different differing levels of capacity. They've all been faced by cuts. And to be honest, like looking at rooftop solar is a load more work 
usually for an energy manager that's already overstretched. And so um, Newport luckily was sort of well, well, well resourced with staff and very, very committed. Um, Pembrokeshire also council also had sort of committed staff, but other, other authorities just simply struggled and you could just see it was an honest problem. Um, leases, that, that was reasonably straightforward. Um, one big advantage that we had in Wales was that um, the local authorities owned the land um, without any kind of, you know, sort of other, other entities owning bits of the schools, etc. Um, whereas in Pratt in England, you've got academies, different trusts, different charities, all running schools because of the way the government's kind of looked at education policy. And I, I can imagine that probably makes it more complicated to get, you know, a single point and, you know, get leases with individual schools. Um, yeah. And then obviously the challenges we faced were the kind of fit deadline and then COVID-19. Uh, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't on our risk register. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So this is what we've been offering to schools, um, a kind of energy data platform um, that, that hasn't been straightforward. We were thinking originally of using the, the Solar Edge platform, which is very good. And that does work very well for sort of single edge, single sites where you can sort of look at on-site generation from the panels and also measure um, on-site supply um, and then use of that supply by the school and how it interacts with the solar panels. And, you know, a number of you will probably have seen the solar edge platform it's it's good the issue with it has been that on some schools where there's sort of five or six buildings we weren't able to uh look at the incoming supply because it's just too complicated and too expensive to set it up via solar edge so we are now looking at a, you know trying to develop a different platform i've been on a few webinars myself i've seen a good platform in 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 belgium that was, that was being used um i've been you know, I know CSE have developed another platform that I've been taken, sort of shown around, um, which has got some potential, I think. Um, but we're also talking to another um, uh, website developer. But if anyone out there has got good examples of workable platforms, and we would be interested as well in platforms that integrate water and uh, heat in in the in the in the sort of platform to show the kind of overall, I guess, sort of carbon footprint of schools, especially. If anyone's got any good examples of that, it'd be really good to share it as part of the chat, I think, uh, on, as, as part of this uh, event. Um, yeah, because we would like to work with schools to kind of integrate that data um, into lessons. Um, we also want to develop sort of, well, we have developed some other educational tools, platforms, and we'll kind of put those onto the website. Um, at the moment, we're kind of doing some research really on what education stuff is out there at the moment, because there is quite a lot. Um, but it's sort of dispersed amongst lots of different organizations and some of the bigger companies like E.ON and EDF have got some good stuff as well. We'd like to secure some funding for a, an education worker to sort of follow up and work with schools. And then one of the other things that we've done is offer 500 pounds of shares in EGNI to all of the schools. And this is kind of just trying to develop understanding of the co-op business model um, and co-op entrepreneurship. Um, and just make it a bit more tangible that you know they the children can understand right this is the generation overall from the panels and this is how that it relates to an interest payment hopefully annually back to the members of the co-op um and we're part of an eu project um called um uh, uh, uh rescoop eu um which is aiming to support co-op entrepreneurship across across the eu we're also offering sort of free visits to see our wind farm um which you know we've, we had a, we've had about um 40 schools uh, visit the wind farm and and they all really enjoy it and we've got educational materials linked to that and i suppose you know overall we can just be open open book about what it costs to, to do any of our projects what income there is generation data it's not kind of private and that, that's what is a bit frustrating i find about lots of the stuff around renewables that it's very you know you have to you know you, you can't log on like you know um it's not not visible it's not public um certainly our wind farm you know I, i'd love our data to be publicly available but there's not an easy way of doing that um it's all controlled by scada and um Enercom, and we haven't found a way of making that data publicly public and usable um next slide please yeah this is a book that we've published we've got um um 
is is online and we're happy to sort of send copies of it to organizations um uh it's kind of based on research that we did for over a sort of year with people in wales and um, we're looking to develop this further um for work in schools but it's a it's a very nice publication of of ways that people are sort of reducing their carbon footprint you know ordinary people um next slide please Yeah, this is the sort of solar edge portal, um, which is good, uh, but doesn't fit the needs really of, of, of you know, I don't think anywhere of, what, of community energy, um, uh, especially in sort of larger school settings. Next one, please. Yeah, and so it, it's good. You can monitor every single panel. Um, so that's interesting for the kids to sort of look at that. Ne next, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so at the moment we're just trying to install as much as we can um, and working with the um, Welsh Government Energy Service to kind of perhaps provide additional capacity to local authorities um, to help work with us because it just requires a lot of coordination, the sort of, um, you know, um, the health and safety, the, the legal side leases, um, uh, you know, the how it's going to link into the sort of data provision to the council to make sure that they can then use it to show that they're achieving their carbon targets um educational side buy-in from the education department from individual schools there is a lot of work to kind of pull it together and so anyway so we're working with the energy service hopefully to provide that support to some local authorities um yeah just goodness knows hope there's no more lockdowns um yeah, there's quite a lot of work in, you know, just the o operation and maintenance of sites, which we're sort of getting to grips with and sort of billing as well, um, making sure that people pay for the electric they use. And the deal is that they get a 20 percent discount against their existing supplier. Um, so, you know, just getting those processes set up, you know, we've got um, different 55 different legal entities that are sort of paying us for the electric. So. The systems required to do that are, are quite a lot. Um, the install cost, um, yeah, trying to get as you know, that as cheaply as possible, but recognizing that there's quite a variation depending on the roof. Um, um, but and also, you know, making sure that they properly deal with sort of CDM responsibilities. Um, uh, and because we we get we get very you know checked up on that but on the local authority sites obviously so we can't just work with you know perhaps a sort of one-man band installer um uh on that scale of sites because there's just a, a kind of um a requirement on them to work in certain ways especially now with covid um that um we just need experienced installers on those sorts of sites ppa prices is a problem export rates are really you know, gone down well they're going a bit back up now but um uh you know that's sort of challenging going forward um the the smart energy guarantee thing doesn't seem to be working um uh so it's not a, it's not a straightforward time for for rooftop solar at the moment i don't think um certainly on purely subsidy free sites because um yeah like buildings aren't being used as much as they as they were and perhaps some buildings won't get used in future um so it's there's a sort of there's, there's risks that we hadn't thought about prior to installation which are sort of happening now um yeah council capacity going forward is an issue we haven't found as yet that kind of availability of panels is a problem um you know we are installing at the moment on a on a 100 kilowatt site on a school in Calais on the um uh in Newport and also the the velodrome which is going to be the biggest rooftop solar install in wales it's 500 kilowatts um it's actually named after Geraint thomas um the velodrome the uh, tour de france winner so we're very excited about that and that's happening that's starting on june the 29th uh next slide please um yeah beyond feed-in tariff um it would be great if if people could sort this procurement thing um it is I, I find it so frustrating that kind of fundamentally it's you know it is it is favoring large the multinationals and it ultimately doesn't lead to a better project you know um 
you know, the, the values are really important and procurement needs to recognize that. And it just feels that we're trying to have to work around it at the moment. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the answer is. Um, subsidy free solar, some of the sites we're doing now are subsidy free. Um, so we've perhaps we've got maybe like I said on the velodrome, it's 100 kilowatts of got feed-in tariff, but beyond that it's subsidy free. Um, so I'm pretty sure that it will work financially. Um, but the, the key thing is it will be to have high on-site use. Um, and so some of the community sites that we've installed on, which you know are only um, uh, you know really used in the evening, um, when obviously the solar isn't going to be generating, I just they're not going to work. Um, unless they're grant funded and I, I think some of the previous presentation which showed the level of grant funding going into some of that, that passive house warehouse you know that's great I just don't know how replicable that is on a, a across you know across whole countries where there's loads of those sorts of buildings especially community buildings but that's what it's going to need unless um, there's kind of interventions by government to help fix that um, you know, we'd be keen to work with other co-ops to reduce reduce costs, joint purchasing, that kind of thing. Um, um, so, if anyone's got ideas on that, that would be that be really useful. And there's one entity that that, that Share Energy, John Halley, are taking forward, Big Solar Co-op, that we're sort of involved with as well, which is hoping to kind of lead um, in some of that cooperation between different co-ops. Next slide, please. So that's it. Jochen Wald, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. That was really useful. Um, we're a little bit pushed for time, but we will get through uh, Ben's presentation. Um, and then actually, I don't mind staying on for another kind of five or 10 minutes, um, if that's helpful to answer some of the questions at the end. Uh, one, just, just while um, Ben gets ready, one very quick question to Dan. Um, you talked a lot about the kind of procurement challenges. Have you found that Wellbeing of Future Generations Act has helped at all, or is it a case that it kind of hasn't filtered down to local authority level, or it's patchy in the way that it's filtered down? Because we've we found some kind of interest from, uh, particularly from private sector, where they're tendering to Welsh government, and and Wellbeing of Future Generations Act has kind of made its way into procurement. But it, it, is it just not coming through at all in local authorities yet? I don't. It's certainly there. It's it's widely talked about, and obviously it's a great piece of legislation. Um, but it's not it's not relevant. It doesn't it does it doesn't feature as a key determinant mm. factor in in yeah. procurement. The the one factor which is there is is that they are very conscious of is that is the tar the twenty thirty target of being local authorities and public sector being. Um, mm if it's carbon neutral or 100% from renewables but you know that, that is a sort of set target and they are very conscious of that yeah um you know the, the sort of social value clauses within procurement um again i'm not you know people talk about it but i've not seen you know really l strong examples of yeah where that's been you know awarded i mean they the you know the, yeah just not making its way down to that level yet and, and working its way into in, into procurement rules no no it's interesting yeah okay no that's great thanks thanks dan that was really interesting really good and great to see that kind of portfolio approach that you're taking uh, to projects and i can't wait to see the uh, installation on the velodrome as well that'll be that'll be really impressive great okay so um i'll just i'll just mute you again dan if that's okay um do feel free to raise a hand if you have other points to contribute later um so if Ben is okay and ready to step in, uh, then we'll move to Ben's presentation. Hi Ben, you should be. Hello. You should be. Hello. Oh, no. Great. Excellent. Right. Thanks, Ben. I will hand over to Ben. Ben is another of my colleagues at Energy Saving Trust, uh, but he's going to talk about a really interesting project that we've worked um, alongside uh, many people from across the community energy sector, but particularly with the um, uh, with kind of people like uh, Leo and Ollie from uh, from 1010 and from Community Energy South, but I'll, I'll I'll hand you over to Ben to talk you through it. Thanks, Ben. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask. Um, oh, right, right. I've been made the um, presenter now. Yeah, Ben, was... you've, you've you've been made the presenter. Oh. Um, if, if Paul oh, can that's unpleasant. Grab, Paul, can you do uh, this for me? Yeah, if Paul can grab back the. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, control. Oh, sorry, because I'm reading notes on another screen, and I think I'll probably make yeah, the best that's fine. Mate. So if I if it, I can rely on you, Paul, I'll be very grateful. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. ask Paul to. Him. I can't resist really? while that's happening. I can't resist responding myself to that that, that that last conversation slightly, which is that I, one thing I see as a risk of those rising the rising urgency of climate targets and response to climate emergency is is actually um, a risk for uh, statutory sector organisations to feel under greater pressure to procure from uh, larger businesses and from you know from um, the private sector because they feel more confidence that they will meet their targets that way. I think that's a real um, risk that the community sector needs to be alert to at the moment. But anyway, yeah, the Green Valley Lines. So it's been lovely to see everyone's presentations this morning, and I'm, we're so grateful. I'm so grateful to be um, working on one bit of the jigsaw that, that that everybody's working on amazing projects in. I've been working for. Um, Welsh Government's community renewables programmes for about the last decade, really, since they since they started in 2010. Um, and I've, uh, over the last few years, split time between EST projects and the Welsh Government Energy Service uh, projects. So my main role in, in the Green Valley Lines project was uh, specifically the, the GIS site searching and the financial modelling. I was part of lots of fascinating conversations with extremely clever engineers which generally culminated by me saying, okay, that's brilliant, how much? Um, so at the outset of the project, uh, we had a, a project description that ran the Green Valley Lines feasibility study will seek to identify the optimal technology mix to allow the South Wales electrified traction system to run fossil free in the future, providing direct traction power supply from community owned renewable electricity generators together with integrated energy storage to reduce the overall costs of providing traction to these lines against a business as usual baseline. What that boiled down to was, um, yeah, we've got the next slide, that's brilliant. How many slides on down are we, in fact? That yeah, should be the first one. Person. Sorry, project partners, thanks. Thanks, Paul, yeah. Yeah, so that what that boiled down to is really, can we utilize the uh, rail networks grid to inject uh, renewable power. Uh, so we had uh, key funders in the Rail Standards and Safety Board and the UK Research Initiative, which is one of the funding streams, and uh, Innovate UK. Um, key uh, partners uh, in that were Transport for Wales, which is a newly formed, fairly newly formed company managing public transport across Wales. Uh, and critically for us, that inc included the new rail franchise across the Wales and Borders network uh, and that was awarded in 2019 to uh, a delivery partnership which was made up of Keolis for the transport service provider and Amy the civil engineers uh, as part of that and then Network Rail obviously are handing over assets uh, to uh, Transport for Wales uh, as part of the setup of that business. Um, part of the uh, Transport for Wales objective under that franchise is a new AC electrification project of the Core Valley lines, which are depicted in the image here. Uh, and those those are the lines that connect Cardiff with Treherbert, Merthyr Tydfil, Rumney, and uh, Ebervale. So if we can have the next slide, please. Um, so this slide just is a, a background showing from uh, from left to right the first two uh, stages of the journey before I um, got involved, really. So you have uh, 1010, uh, Climate Advocacy, charity um, who were working with uh, Balcom, um, who were first protesting against fracking and then feeling they should do something constructive and build their own um, solar farm. So along with uh, Community Energy England, they looked at could they connect a solar farm to the railway. Um, 1010 have since become possible and they've set up riding Sunbeam's kick. Um, and um, they have then undertaken a first light project on the DC side of the line at uh, Aldershot. So the question was, um, could the infrastructure of the rail and ne rail electrical network be utilized more fully? Um, is it underutilized at the moment? Could we inject renewable power to it? And that first uh, report on the left there identified that there was a massive opportunity uh, to provide that energy. Uh, because network rail holds its own license, operates its own electrical network. 
Um, it, that does involve some unavoidable spill back through the grid supply points and onto uh, the transmission or distribution network where relevant for so the UK uh, network. But the license at the moment doesn't formally extend uh, to uh, actively exporting power uh, with a PPA in place from the rail network and onto UK grid. So there were different electrical engineering solutions identified to supply to two different types of rail electrical network that you can have a high voltage AC or low voltage DC um, rail traction section. So typically the low voltage DC is what you expect to see in a, a metro or an underground third rail system and high voltage AC is your overhead uh, gantries. Um, the first report found that they wanted to focus on DC because the power injection points are more frequent and uh, it was felt that that made for an easier engineering solution but that did leave a big question about uh, providing renewable energy to AC rail traction because that's a much larger global opportunity to decarbonize so if we have the next slide please um, we had some quite useful drivers in place. Uh, we've got that rising profile of climate emergency on a UK government on a global basis. We've got Climate Change Commission recommending zero carbon by 2050. In Welsh government, we've obviously got the Wellbeing Act, which has just been discussed. We've also got some quite useful renewable energy and local generation and ownership targets. So there's an expectation that Wales will have a gigawatt of renewable energy generation in local ownership by 25 and that all new energy projects from this year will have at least an element of uh, local ownership. Uh, and then obviously that contract for Transport for Wales, their, their remit and the contract that they passed down to the Wales and Borders franchise um, is looking for, in addition to the targets in the graphic, it's looking for net zero emissions across all franchise operations by 2030 and 50% of the traction load to be met by renewable power from Welsh generation by 2025. So they're quite ambitious uh, targets. Um, and the opportunity presented was that uh, the South Wales Metro uh, included this new AC electrification of the Core Valley lines. So uh, that seemed to present an opportunity for integrating design of the traction supply network um, with that uh, injection of new renewable power and that might get round the distance between the injection points. Uh, so the uh, funding that we got was consistent with this uh, challenge from the UK Minister for Rail. Another driver that we did look at was carbon pricing. Uh, in the event uh, we found that the financial viability looked good enough and uh, we chose not to model that in partly because it was actually quite intractable to get at a decent set of assumptions. So if we have the next slide, please. Uh, this slide, there's an example in the image of the work undertaken by Ricardo uh, towards their, their work was understanding the demand profile and the, the power injection options and engineering designs on the different line sections. And you can see we've got different line sections, each with different demand profiles and in places with different headroom capacity, uh, depending on whether you have one or two uh, 10 megawatt capacity overhead lines. So we aspired to co-design the engineering solution. It didn't work out quite that way, as you'll see later. Um, but to do that detailed interface design, match that load profile. Uh, but we also in the project wanted to find real live projects on the ground that could come out as a portfolio legacy uh, in the event that uh, we were successful in getting the engineering solutions and the cost viability. Uh, so, and then um, the outputs would include uh, sharing some of those learnings for wider application and scaling up. So, for the next slide, uh, this is very much a best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, I'm sure this is common to a, a lot of projects. Um, we came across challenges and we came up with solutions. Really, what happened was that that work streams that we thought had fairly simple dependencies. Uh, became very iterative and dependent on reviewing findings across the uh, work streams. The first real barrier we got was that we arrived at the beginning of the project and the grid supply points had already been fixed. So that aspiration to co-design uh, went straight down the down down the loo really. But uh, 
happily um, the engineering design came up with the potential to just build a new connection on a new gantry pretty much anywhere at um, uh, really quite a reasonable cost. £100,000 wasn't um, an unbearable cost to build into the model. Uh, another thing we hadn't anticipated was the massive cost of uh, available converters to take the renewable power and condition it uh, in a suitable way to put onto that overhead line. The converters available did far more than we needed them to, but uh, the cost at about a thousand pounds per kilowatt was extremely painful. So um, that's our next step out of the project is to target um, a new converter technology at a bearable cost. We had um, planned as part of the uh, project to model battery storage. Um, I think really what prevented that was that the PPA model, once we were selling a large amount of the energy direct to the rail network, um, was so good that it made the battery storage prohibitively expensive. It can, certainly has capacity to add some carbon saving and some effectiveness in that way, but um, it reduces the value of the cost model when you introduce batteries. Uh, we found out that uh, valley lines often have quite hilly steep slopes beside them, so you can't always put solar PV very very close to the lines, but um, we found plenty of solar sites that were close enough to work at about a, a one or two kilometres uh, distance according to the, the first solar and wind. Um, and then we found out that we could generate stacks of energy near to, near to the track to supply the traction demand, but actually that headroom on the lines of about 10 megawatts um, for an overhead line is quite a constraining factor. So if we go to the next slide. This table is actually slightly out of date um, because I'm reworking some of the financial assumptions at the moment, but <clears throat> we quite quickly discovered when we looked at that converter price and picked out some target costs, um, price points. Um, and once we'd set our financial assumptions, we were able to start establishing what scale of site, this shows solar PV, but we, we worked for wind as well. What were the minimum scales of sites uh, that would meet our, um, our benchmarks or our hurdle rates uh, for IRR and debt service cover ratio? Um, so across the different lines, we had to model for the different consumptions, but you can see, um, particularly in the traction demand met line, is the one that I find most interesting in uh, in these tables, that uh, you can start to meet quite a significant amount of uh, traction demand with uh, one site, but also with, with more than one site once you add them together and maximize the um, capacity, which is shown on the next slide, please. Once we'd identified those um, bottom lines, then we could pick out the sites from our site finding exercise. Uh, and from a, a long list, we arrived at a short list. Uh, that shows that this uh, the Transport for Wales target of uh, meeting 50% of traction power from local renewables can be far exceeded, as you can see in the right-hand column. Uh, from from real site potential that we've identified. Um, so again, it is that uh, that 10 megawatt AC limit that is a key factor. Uh, one next step is to do some more refined modeling on this because we remained with a fairly crude assumption uh, of uh, capping it at 10. But we do know that when we do more careful modeling of wind profiles versus solar, uh, generation profiles and against rail demand, we can probably connect quite a bit more over our overall capacity, 12, 13, 14 megawatts, in the knowledge that uh, we will very rarely meet a peak that exceeds the 10 megawatt uh, line capacity. So, yeah, I think uh, next slide is good there. So, what we found is that there are conditions that have to be met for this to work. It's absolutely essential for the financial model that the rail electrical network license is changed and that uh, it's possible to push power back through the grid supply 
points. So those those grid supply points are they've got the capacity in themselves. They've got the um, fusing capacity to push that power back. All we're doing is um, making more efficient utilization of the rail network and uh, pushing away the need for reinforcement uh, cost on the on the um, national grid. So. Uh, we could also sleeve PPAs once we can push out onto the grid back to the rail operators so we could increase the amount uh, of contribution towards their target for local generation. It's essential that we get a converter technology at the right cost point. It doesn't exist at the moment. I think there's fair confidence that because the ones that exist at the moment are over-specified, we should be able to pull that cost down. And for battery storage to be cost effective, the price of battery storage will need to come down further, although as I, as I noted, there are uh, certainly carbon benefits uh, if the um, national grid can't be used effectively as a, as a replacement for battery storage. So next slide, please. Um, so the outcomes are that we've, we've got a technically capable engineering solution and we've found out that we can rep replicate that um, across railways. We don't need to be co-designing with a new electrification project to make this work. We've identified what the regulatory market barriers to deploying that are. Um, we've demonstrated that that is a meaningful uh, route to market and a meaningful way of uh, getting much better utilization from a huge amount of rail electrical infrastructure that's already there. Um, and we have a benchmark and methodology that can be shared to help people to identify the correct scale and type of generation projects to connect and where to locate them. Uh, in relation to the railway. So under those corrected conditions, we know that we can meet Transport for Wales's objectives. Um, uh, hopefully the Welsh Government Energy Service can now, with Riding Sunbeams, take a portfolio forward to uh, to help them to do that and to make sure that communities have a really significant stake uh, in delivering that. And the final slide then, please, is uh, really those next uh, next steps which I've just described pretty really much. I hope I've uh, spun through that quick enough. I tried to, uh, it was a bit dense. Excellent. I tried to Thanks, run ben. through that. Um, That's really, thank you very really much for your time. Thanks, Ben. That was great. Um, so yeah, really interesting project there. Huge, huge potential opportunity. Um, and a lot of interest. Uh, I'm conscious of time. We're, we're slightly over time. Uh, so we will, finish now. I am just going to very quickly respond to a couple of questions that we hadn't responded to, mainly passing through to kind of this afternoon really. Uh, so um, we had a couple of questions about Scotland and Wales seem to get um, a lot of support. Uh, Chris Rollins raised this. We'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon but essentially that comes from Scottish and Welsh government uh, made policy decisions to put extra support into these areas um, and, and that's why those those programs have have been set up it has just come down from kind of political decisions by uh, Scottish and Welsh governments um, we we have tried our best to, to kind of be open to sharing that information with anyone who's interested including uh, people at Bayes um, but obviously, you know, it would have to be a political decision from uh, from Westminster, I guess, to implement something similar um, in uh, in England. But as I said, we're always happy to share the experience that we've had of working in in, in Wales and Scotland. And I know that Welsh Welsh government and Scottish government are also uh, happy to share those things. Um, and then the other question was just about. Um, uh, about a risk that the UK gets left behind as we leave the EU. Um, how can we have a voice and influence government policy around community energy as we leave the EU? Um, from Chris at CES and Ovesco. Yeah, absolutely uh, agree. I think certainly, as I said, we as an organisation are keen to stay engaged um, with Europe and keep communicating. And our experience has been that everyone that we work with in Europe is is really keen to, to still involve UK. Um, so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. We engage with government and try to um, um, 
get good policy there but i think you know all of us as individuals and organizations can still um, engage with other countries as as we see fit uh dan mentioned rescoop which is kind of you know europe-wide um cooperatives associate uh, renewable energy cooperatives association uh, and we've certainly been working with them on on this project um so all of that stuff we can pick up again this afternoon uh so um I'd just like to say thanks very much to everyone who's joined. Um, sorry for the couple of gremlins we had this afternoon. We will just run the presentations and, and get people to um, uh, uh, ask for things to be clicked through. So hopefully that will all run a bit smoother. So hopefully we might uh, speak to a lot of you again this afternoon after lunch. Um, but in the meantime, thanks, thanks very much to everyone. And uh, we will just, uh, if you have any other questions, do feel free to pose them and, and uh, we can always get back to you by email afterwards. Thanks.